I will be honest, this is not a talk I've ever given before. Um, it's kind of a unique topic that people don't often think of. I'm often talks, asked to talk about specific disease processes, about you know concerns of the elderly, since I am a geriatrician by training. Um, but I, this is an important topic for patients of all ages. And so um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about it. And we'll welcome your, your questions at the end. So getting started. So the title of my talk is Establishing a Health Baseline, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of connecting to the medical world can be a daunting task, and knowing where to start is an important way to kind of set yourself on a path toward achieving your healthcare goals. So the case for a baseline from a slightly biased point of view. Uh, I am a primary care provider by training, and so you know I, I firmly believe in the ounce of, of prevention method of uh, approaching healthcare. Um, and so you'll need to take what I say with a grain of salt, since since that is my my wheelhouse, so to speak. But I think it's important to kind of look at why is this even important. So who needs to establish a baseline with with a healthcare provider? The short answer is. Almost everyone, if you have medical illnesses, it may be more pertinent than, than if you f you're seemingly healthy. Um, but as I'll go through here briefly, I think the population of people that really need to kind of form a baseline with a provider is, is broader than you may initially think. So what exactly is a baseline? Um, it's fairly similar to what you would think about. It's not like it's a formal term that we, we throw out all the time, but it's more of a general concept. It's, it's essentially where you as an individual are at on the broader spectrum of your overall health. And that's not just physical health, but also your mental health and emotional health and where you are. And so I, I use this um, diagram kind of as a, it, it's a, a subway map and it says you are here. And it's just meant to illustrate that there are many lines that, that uh, you need to navigate as part of your overall health perspective. And you know, establishing care with a provider can help you do that. Um, so essentially, your baseline, though, if you want to break it down into kind of more definitive components, you, your health is your existing illness as well as your risk for future illness. And seeing you, know, you may not have much existing illness, but preparing for the future can be, can be an important part of maintaining good health. Um, the goal is really for this to be a starting point for you to kind of make some plans and decide what actions you need to take now for your future health care. So the next question, which I've heard from my husband time and again, is why do I need to establish a health baseline? People generally don't like to go to the doctor or the nurse practitioner or PA or whoever you seek for your, your health care. Um, it can be time consuming, it can be expensive, it can be just difficult to work into your, your daily schedule and busy life. Um, you may think, I'm healthy, I take no medications, why do I need to go see somebody? And the, the short answer is because you may not stay healthy. Because although you may not have illness now, you may need to do things now to prevent illness down the road. So. There are basically two components to good health. So there's the appropriate treatment of current illness, which is what everyone classically thinks that we as physicians do. Um, but there's also appropriate prevention to help prevent further illness down the road. And that's really where establishing a baseline can help improve your outcomes uh, and improve your life down the road as well. Specific things we'd look to prevent would be hospitalizations, you know, Stanford Hospital is a wonderful place, but if you can avoid hospitals in any case, you'll be better off for it in the long run. Um, medications, medical science has brought us many amazing, you know, drugs that can do wonderful things. But if you can avoid having to take anything, as a geriatrician I've seen, you're, you're better in the long run. And, and finally, procedures and surgeries. Although we can do amazing things with hip replacements and, you know, abdominal surgeries and things like that, if you can avoid needing to have these things, it's, it's always better to avoid that kind of risk. But you know, in medicine and in science, we like to see things from kind of a data-driven perspective. So is there any evidence to show that it's worthwhile for people to kind of establish a general healthcare baseline? So we'll start with the negative evidence. 
Um, this is by no means a comprehensive review of all the literature on preventative care, um, but it's just kind of, kind of an overview to give you some idea of, of, of why there may be mixed views among different, um, different experts as to whether it's really worthwhile to establish with a primary care doctor. So uh, one good source I found was a meta-analysis. It consisted of 14 randomized controlled trials, which are considered excellent when you're reviewing medical literature. Um, it looked at 182,880 adults. So things that general health checks do not do. They do not decrease morbidity or mortality related to cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of death in the United States at close to 600,000 deaths per year. And it doesn't decrease morbidity or mortality from, from cancer either, which is close behind as the second um, cause of death in the United States. They also do not create changes in the rates of cardiovascular disease, rates of cerebrovascular disease, so strokes, TIAs, if you've heard things like that, or rates of cancer. And from a strictly business standpoint, there's no change in the rate of those costly hospital admissions, um, in the number of referrals to specialists, or in the number of work absences. So not a great case I'm making so far. The one thing that was proven to be changed by you know, having people get these general health exams, you do increase the overall number of diagnoses that you give to people, which is true. If you go to see a doctor or uh, whatever primary care provider you see, chances are you're going to walk out with a diagnosis or two that you didn't have when you walked in. But it's not all doom and gloom. Primary care is not going out of business anytime soon because there are still many good reasons and good scientific evidence behind it. So first start by looking at kind of the limitations of these negative studies that we've had that just painted this terrible picture of kind of doing this preventative health type check. So a lot of the trials that I referenced there in that meta-analysis, they're older trials done anywhere from 1963 to 1999. They really don't account for potential benefits of newer advancements and treatments that we have, for instance, screening tests and things like that. We have come a long way over the decades since 1963 and what we can do to help improve people's care. And these studies simply don't take that into account. Um, the settings of the exams for many of these studies, it wasn't that they went into Dr. Jones's office down the road and looked at his patients and saw how they turned out. It was they collected subjects, they um, put them through a routine screening with a person they had never met or formed any sort of a relationship with who probably had limited information regarding their past medical history, family history, social history, et cetera, and they looked at the basic scientific outcome very different than the general scenario in a primary care provider's office. And then there's the, the usual reasons I call them for why trials are bad. Sample sizes, bias, statistical analyses not being ideal. All the usual reasons we call into question many of this data that we are so driven to, to look at closely. Survey says, in a survey done by the American Academy of Family Practice, again a little biased, 66% of patients prefer to have an, an annual physical exam. And I, I have this happen all the time in my practice where I have patients come in and, and I'll say, what can I do to help you? What's your, you know, what can I help you with today? Do you have a complaint, concern, what can I do for you? And they say, I'm just here for my annual checkup. And, it's not often that happens, but when it does, it, it really drives home this idea that people just want to make sure things are okay. And this somehow we have it in our head that once a year is the time to do it. Maybe that part of that comes from insurances encouraging you to get your annual exams, et cetera, et cetera. But um, people do like the idea of having an annual, an annual physical. Another systematic review looked at 21 studies. 10 of them were those good old randomized controlled trials. And their conclusions were that there are um, multiple positive effects on patients specifically who underwent recommended screening, such as pap smears, cholesterol, uh, FOB is fecal occult blood, if any of your doctors have ever had you do that. Um, so testing the, the stools for blood as a means of assessing your risk of colon cancer. Um, and you know these preventative screenings that are proven by very good data that if you 
do them across the population, it can decrease your rates of things we worry about, like cancer, like heart disease, like stroke. And for what it's worth, they found a decrease in patient worry. People just felt better when they had their check-in with their primary care provider and felt like they had a good assessment of how they were doing from a health standpoint. Another study, and this was published in the International Journal of Health Services, found that states with more primary care providers per capita had lower rates of cardiovascular disease, rates of cerebrovascular events, and rates of cancer. You may remember that list of same things that I put um, from the NAE studies that you know, general health checks were not proven to do. So whether you can make the link between just there being more primary care providers and better overall health outcomes, again, that's a matter of statistical interpretation, but it is uh, something that was, was observed and, and probably has some merit to consider. And then yet another study found that having a primary care provider is associated with a longer lifespan. Again, not the randomized controlled study, not necessarily the most rigorous scientific method used for this, but in general, um, it can help in some studies to, to improve your lifespan. So looking at all that data, general health checks seem to have more of a thumbs up approach. As the truth is in many scientific issues, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. We probably don't know. These are very difficult studies to do. And there's not a lot of financial incentive to, to be driving these things. But I think health systems in general are looking more towards a proactive approach to health as opposed to a reactive approach. And so I think we're going to see more and more of this data coming out about is it worthwhile um, to kind of engage in more preventative health care. I think a lot of the data right now is coming out of the UK um, because with their um, single payer system, they need to know is it worthwhile for us to screen you know, the entire population uh, of, a, of the health system? Is that, is that a financially reasonable thing to do? So what do you do? Well, uh, next I want to give you some reasons of how a, a health baseline um, can really help you know, show tangible outcomes for you. Not just you'll feel better, maybe you'll live longer, maybe you'll have a less risk of a heart attack, but, but what can it do for you? So who knows who these ladies are? So we have Mary Tyler Moore, who is one of my all-time favorite people, Halle Berry, a, a starlet of herself. Anybody know what they have in common? They both have diabetes, very good. So they both have very similar stories too, where, I mean, they are not the typical picture of diabetes. Um, they are thin, fit young women who were diagnosed with diabetes at a very young age. I think, um, you know, Holly Berry's story is much more dramatic where she was feeling fatigued and all of a sudden she went into this coma and no one knew what was wrong with her and it turned out she was a diabetic. Mary Tyler Moore has a much more reasonable story, which was she was busy acting and she just wasn't feeling quite right and she went into the hospital for another unrelated procedure and they found that her blood sugar was over 700, which normally our blood sugars run in the 100, 200, 300 range even after we've eaten, so really high blood sugar. And that's how she found out that she was a diabetic. Neither way is an ideal way to find out that you have a debilitating disease like diabetes. But although I call it debilitating, it's also very treatable and it's something that can be very well managed if you have a good relationship with your provider that is managing this disease for you. And diabetes aside, it more broad general health issues, you know, a, a, the goal of a health baseline would be to help you, you know, prioritize what are your actual issues that you'd like to address and goals that you'd like to achieve and what's going to be an effective intervention for doing this? You know, let's say that your goal is, you know, I just, I want to lose some weight. I put on some weight, you know, in, in my 30s after I had my babies and I just would like to lose some weight. And, you know, rather than just doing another fad diet or yo-yoing and starving yourself and then ending up just binging on sweets later, you know, talking to a, a primary care provider can help find a more reasonable approach to meeting your healthcare goals. 
So when should you have this done? How often do you need to see a doctor? How often do you need to have regular follow-up? And as the answer so often is in medicine, it depends. If you have multiple chronic issues that need to be managed, if you have you know, recent illness, recent surgery, you may be seeing your, your primary care provider on a more regular basis. You may also need to be seeing other providers. However, if you're 25 years old, you have no real medical history, you have low risk factors, and you just are out of that window where you know, we start our lives being dragged to the doctor's office by our parents because we need our immunizations and they check our weight and our height and all of those good things. And then as we move into high school, we have the mandatory school physicals, sports physicals, et cetera. And then in college or you know, whatever your post high school life is, you are just busy and young and think you're invincible and don't care. And then somewhere along the way, you get a job and either your job makes you get a physical or you just kind of fall off the radar of the medical world. And many people stay off that radar for decades until something happens. And what I'm hoping to you know, get across to you today is it may not be the most efficient or effective means of, of really taking control of your health and, and preventing long-term outcomes. So the, the answer is it depends. But the most important thing to know is that there are recommended routine preventative services like mammograms, like pap smears, like colon cancer screening that need to be done regardless of how frequently you see your primary care provider. And so staying in touch with them, having someone that, that is you know, keeping tabs on you, so to speak, can help make sure that these things do get done. Because regardless of whatever data I've shown you so far, there is excellent data that these type of preventative interventions do make a difference in people's uh, long-term morbidity and mortality. So. I'm going to assume that I convinced you all that you should go see a primary care doctor. Um, and so the next thing I'd like to talk about and kind of switch gears a little bit and do is talk about what, should, what is that first visit going to look like? Whether it's, you know, you haven't been to the doctor in 15 years and you don't even know where to start, or it's you've moved to a new area, or you've just switched, you know, switched providers. What can help you get off to a good start as you're trying to establish this healthcare baseline? Especially if you feel like you're healthy, you take no medicines. Where do, what do you even say? Are you just going to awkwardly sit there in silence and wonder if they're going to make you put a gown on and you know, hope that they don't sh you know, give you a shot today? Or, or are you, you going to take some proactive steps to make it a useful visit for you and for your provider? So step one, the most important, find the right person for you. It can make a huge difference on how you view the medical system, view your health, and how, how you interact with it down the road um, if you find the right person. Um, so the first one I said is, is provider. So there's a million doctors out there you can see. Some patients I have, they've, they've just followed with a cardiologist who's become like their primary care doctor over the, over the decades and that's who they trust. And they came to my office in the geriatrics department because they were in the hospital and the discharge planner referred them to me or their daughter thought they needed someone else and they dragged them into the office. You know, there's there's a lot of reasons, but you know, if you're, you know, if you're obviously if you're a child, then a pediatrician or a family doctor may be a better option for you. If you're kind of in that middle age range, then you think maybe a family doctor, maybe an internist, and then as you get older, maybe you've had your same internist for 20, 30 years, and you're perfectly happy, and that person's not retiring anytime soon, so you're okay to stick with them, or. Maybe you worry that your health is getting more complex and that you are concerned about the issues that go along with, um, with growing older. And so maybe a geriatrician may be a better option for you. Finally, some, you know, some women in their childbearing ages, their obstetrician gynecologist ends up serving as their primary care doctor. Whatever the provider you choose, it's, it's important that you uh, feel comfortable with them and that you, you know, are willing to kind of establish a long-term relationship with them um, so that you have that continuity of someone who knows you. Um, number two is an important one that we see all the time. It's insurance coverage. So you may think that you found the expert and the best person in the world, but if they don't take your insurance, whatever that may be, it can end up being a very expensive endeavor. So I think most offices are, you know, their intake coordinators are trained to to check with you and talk with you about you know, what financial expenses may be incurred um, in, in establishing this baseline. 
but it is something important to, to consider um, as you're looking out to establish care with someone. And finally, it's personal preference. So how do you find that person that you're going to trust and spill your health guts to and feel like you can talk to and ask questions to and is really going to do a good job for you? Um, what I usually tell you know, friends and family is ask your neighbor, you know, ask your friend, ask someone who you feel is similar to you. Hey, who's your primary care doctor? You know, who do you know that's good or who do you like? Or you know, if you have that, that cardiologist that you know and trust, like, can you recommend someone to me? Um, it's, it's a great way to start. You know, there are, just like patients, providers have a wide array of personalities. And, and finding the right fit can be important in you being willing to, to stay with the same person rather than kind of jumping around and you know, trying, to, trying to find someone that, that maybe fits you, maybe doesn't. Um, do your homework is my next take home point. So it, if you're willing to put some work in before you show up at the doctor's office, you're probably going to get a lot more out of your appointment. So the first thing I always say is, is there a pre-visit questionnaire for you to fill out? Now many times if you show up, they'll hand you a sheet of paper on a clipboard with a bunch of things for you to sign and ask you to fill stuff out. And there you are on the spot trying to remember if anyone in your family had heart disease and, you know, when was the last time that I, you know, saw my other doctors or what was, what's that dose of medication that I'm on? And you're trying to fill all this out on the spot or they may not even hand it to you and you're you're left to try to discuss all of this with your doctor um, during the visit itself, which is often a fairly short time to begin with. If you, when you're making your appointment, it, you can ask, do you, does your office have a pre-visit questionnaire that you could send me that I could complete ahead of time? Um, or is there going to be one that I, I will be filling out and what information should I have for that? And whoever you're speaking to to schedule the appointment will be able to tell you that kind of information. Outside records, have you been seeing another doctor? Have you been hospitalized recently? Have you been to the emergency room lately? These are all important things for your physician or other provider to know um, in order to be able to accurately take care of you. Um, and having copies of those at your visit can really expedite your care. Of course, we can always request records, you know, but that ends up being a very lengthy inefficient process that often never happens. I spend most of my day requesting records and I'd say I get maybe 30% of them back. And then it's often instead of, you know, I, I need your most recent labs, I get a stack this tall with notes and notes and notes and notes of stuff. And then important information gets lost just because it's, it's not the information we need. So trying to get outside records ahead of time can really help expedite your first visit. Um, immunizations. Every good primary care provider will ask you about whether you've had all of your vaccines. So your flu shot, your, your pneumonia shot, your tetanus shot. These are important things that you're going to need to know. And if you haven't, there are things that you could have done at that visit rather than worry about just finding out you need them later and then having to come back for a separate visit. So knowing your immunizations ahead of time can be helpful. As I mentioned, have you been to ED, emergency department? Um, have you been to you know, Stanford's emergency department to express care or to see any specialists recently? Having that information ahead of time with you will certainly help speed things along. Um, have you seen other physicians in the past? Um, here at Stanford, we do have the Care Everywhere um, application built into our electronic record. So if you are seeing it, anyone that uh, any of the other uh, healthcare systems that we are um, in collaboration with, such as Palo Medical Foundation, um, UCSF, then there is some ability for us to interface and pull up records that you have there, and they can do the same with us. I will say there's a limit to that, though. Number one, we need your permission. Number two, what's there is not always what we need. <laughs> and number three, out of context, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you being aware of those records and ready to discuss them with your provider can make a huge difference in, in the efficiency and effectiveness of your visit. Um, and finally, family history. I find that's one that people struggle with a lot, and yet it's one that's so important. Because a lot of what we talk about in, in preventative care and health baseline is preventing things from happening that you are at risk for. And so much of your risk comes from you know, your genetic you know dispositions that you have and 
you know, you may try to be thinking back, you know, did my grandma have atrial fibrillation or why did she have that pacemaker? Or did I have a cousin that died suddenly, you know, at a young age? You know, these are things that, that do make a difference in, in terms of what we think is, is a risk for you. And so having that in your head when you show up is helpful. The caveat I will say is when I ask someone, any medical problems run in your history, I often get, well, my grandma's sister had, you know, diabetes or things like that. Not as relevant as my mother had diabetes and my sister has diabetes. So first degree relatives, so mom and dad, siblings, and any children you have are really where you want to start when you're telling your provider about what types of issues run in your family. Next is arrive early, and this is especially true here at Stanford. <laughs> so, you know, we live in the Bay Area where traffic is a constant battle, um, and parking is not much better. And, you know, there's a lot of wonderful construction going on for um, the new hospital, for new facilities, and just general road repair. But all of these can really delay um, your arrival unexpectedly. And your, the time you have is so precious, and there's so much to fit in, especially at that first baseline visit, that you want to make sure you're there on time. I know we have the issue that, if you'll notice outside, the brand new neuroscience building that's going up. It's going to be gorgeous if you've looked on the website and seen the plans for it. Right now, what it does is take up our handicapped parking, <laughs> at least a lot of it. And as a geriatrician, that's a huge issue. And so. You know, it, it's very difficult if some, any of you parked in the garage to, that, that's quite a hike to get from the garage and then we're up on the fourth floor. And if you have, uh, you know, difficulty getting around, that can be quite a journey for you. And to allot that time in is, is not something most people think about. So think about getting there early. But even if you are on time, you may still end up waiting. <laughs> That's a constant complaint of most patients is I waited an hour and a half to see this person and they gave me 15 minutes and that's all I got. And, and that is a risk. That is certainly a risk. I would say, at least in the primary care world, our, our goal is to get as much done for you as we possibly can. We recognize your time is precious. Our time is also precious. I say, especially as a geriatrician, we also, we often take longer than we think it should with, you know, let's say the first patient of the day. But we really do do our best that if we're 15 minutes late getting in to see you, it's because we took our time and we're very thorough with that last patient and we will pay that forward to you. And although it may end up pushing everyone back and making everyone behind, we'll hopefully be able to catch up at some point. But the goal would be that if we have robbed you of 15 minutes of your time on the front end of your visit, we'll be able to make it up on the back end of it and make sure that you've gotten to say everything you need to say, discuss everything we need to discuss, and um, you know, at the very least apologize for the inconvenience of being late. Emergencies happen, things come up. I think many people think that you know, physicians are just sitting back at their desk drinking coffee and reading the news, and that's why we're behind. And I, I will say that that is certainly not, not the case. Um, come prepared. So this is my general list. So one thing I always recommend is a pen and paper because we say a lot of things. I know I write things down all the time during the visit. And it's important that you do the same because inevitably someone is going to ask you, so what did the doctor say? And you're going to think back and it was all so clear just five minutes ago and all of a sudden you remember nothing. And how many of you have tried to call your doctor's office after your appointment and try to get to talk to someone and figure out what they said? It can be quite a challenge. Maybe you'll reach, you know, when you call our office, a lot of times you'll get our centralized call center here at Stanford. They are very well trained and they are, you know, very good at their jobs. But they're not the person that just saw you who could answer quickly and say, oh, I said take two of those pills instead of one. And so it, it can create a lot of extra legwork on your part. So take a pen and paper, write things down. It, not, it can be helpful not just writing down what your provider tells you, but also questions that may come up as your provider's talking to you that you can remember to ask later. Um, 
try to have a list of questions and concerns ahead of time um, because that will help drive the visit to you getting the answers you need. Many times people come in with a list of 20 things and I'll say, let's give me your top three and we'll get through those today and I promise we will get to the rest when we can. So having those things in mind can help make sure that you get your questions answered and your most pressing issues addressed. Bring your pill bottles. If you are on medications, there is no substitute for having the actual bottles with the doses, with the pharmacy you filled it at, and with how many pills you actually have left. For some of my patients, that's almost a trash bag full of pills, but it's worthwhile in terms of accuracy since medications are not something to be taken lightly. They are a chemical substance that can affect your body and if in taken incorrectly, can have major detrimental effects. So having your physician or other provider having an accurate picture of what you're taking and how it's going is really important. So although it can be a pain and although it may mess up your pill box system or whatever you use, try to bring your actual bottles in addition to your list of medications with you. Um, I always say bring a calendar because inevitably you're going to have to schedule something, whether it's a test or a lab or a follow-up appointment. Have your calendar with you so that you can get that on the books and it's not something that's going to fall by the wayside and all of a sudden you, it's six months later and you were supposed to follow up in three months. So bring your calendar with you. Um, it can be worthwhile to check ahead of time um, if you need to be fasting that day. Your doctor may be ordering labs and although with new technology, there is rarely a time when you need to fast, but in some circumstances you do. In those circumstances, I recommend getting an early appointment because you don't want to show up fasting to a two o'clock appointment and then have your doctor be behind by 40 minutes and you're starving. Um, and speaking of that, I always say bring a snack. That's my general motto in life is bring a snack because you just never know what's going to happen. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't get more impatient or angry when, than when I haven't eaten in a while. And and it can be a while. It can be a never-ending journey when you are, have a doctor's appointment for the day, um, but it's worthwhile. And the one caveat I want to add is when you talk, tell your provider what I'm taking, it's not just what they've prescribed you. Do you take things like Tylenol, Advil, other over-the-counters, any vitamins you may take, and any supplements you take especially? Not only is it important just for the accuracy of what you're taking in, but sometimes these things can interact with other medications you're taking. Things like Advil, as a geriatrician, I hate Advil. It can be very dangerous for the kidneys. It can cause bleeding ulcers. It can do terrible, terrible things to older people. And so I, I, I just had it happen last week where someone happened to mention you know, I was looking at their kidney function and it seemed like it was kind of creeping up and they're like, oh, I take an Advil to help me sleep sometimes. And you know, you think of it offhandedly. I buy it at Walgreens. It's on the shelf. I can buy it. But they can have major effects. So letting your provider know exactly what you take is critical um, for their decision-making process. So what do you expect? Anybody know who that is? Do we have any Downton Abbey fans in the room? That's Dr. Clarkson. I love him. Anyway. Um, He's definitely the, the old school physician who goes the extra mile for his patients and, and uh, he's an excellent role model for, for pro providers everywhere. Uh, but, but so what do you expect when you get there? We talked about the traffic and the construction and the weights and the, you know, everything that might happen. Um, be expected that you may need to have lab work done. So have blood drawn and evaluated. Um, some of it is just routine screenings, like as we mentioned earlier, having your cholesterol evaluated. Um, but there may be needles involved. Some people are fairly squeamish about needles, um, but it's, it's an important thing to do if it is ordered. Here at Stanford, we have the luxury of if you, for instance, are seeing anyone in internal medicine, family medicine, or geriatrics here in this building, the lab is on the first floor. So I can tell my patients, Go to the elevator, get off on the first floor, and turn left. And right there is our lab. Um, it also makes things very easy in terms of getting results back to me quickly and allowing me to discuss what these results mean with patients. Um, sometimes it's a little more of a hike um, to, to get to the lab. But just keep in mind that you may be asked to do labs right away or to plan to have them done in the future, again, where that calendar comes in handy. 
Um, will you need any studies? This is a, uh, an important point that I, I would like to drive home is that you, you may have x-rays ordered or you know, a CAT scan or an MRI or various different imaging or other procedures that your provider may order for you. Everyone is different in terms of how it gets scheduled. Let's say I order an x-ray of your chest. If you come to my office, you could still come right downstairs and get that. But if I order an MRI, then that's a different process. Sometimes you call them, sometimes they call you. And kind of knowing the logistics of how is this going to happen are an important thing to ask your provider. Because you may be sitting around for weeks waiting for the MRI department to call you and schedule this procedure, and it may not happen. And if that doesn't happen, then it's important to check back with your provider on, were they supposed to call me? Did I miss the memo that I'm calling them? What's the number for them, et cetera? And, and there you have delayed care, delayed evaluation, and you know, possibly delayed treatment. So if, you're, if something is ordered, try to be very specific in asking, should I expect a call? Maybe tell your provider what number should they be calling. For some of my older patients that are hard of hearing and you know, may not have the, the memory to be able to schedule things themselves, I may put in their referral, please contact daughter and put her name and contact information in when I place the referral. So having that information ready to go and thought about when, when things are ordered can be very helpful. Also, you may need a shot. Everyone's, you know, from, from the time you're young, you, you dread immunizations, and, and there again, the needles can be a fear. Um, but they're also one of the most important things that you can do, not just to protect yourself, but to protect others. I often have patients tell me, you know, in the geriatric world, I've never had a flu shot, I don't need a flu shot, I'm fine. And then I say, do you have grandchildren? Or do you have great-grandchildren or little babies that could, you know, could become very ill and hospitalized because they get the flu? You may not, you may feel fine, but you're, you can still pass that on to others that may be more at risk. So when you think about and think, I've never had a flu shot or I've never had some other vaccine, why should I get it now? It's not just about you, it's about the risk of those around you as well. Um, the other caveat I'll add is it often helps to wear short sleeves <laughs> to your doctor's appointments because you will need to get to your arms and listen to your heart and lungs and so um, try to dress appropriately when you go. And finally, referrals. Um, we have excellent, some of the world's top specialty providers here at Stanford. And the question is, should you see them? There's, there are doctors and providers for just about every specific problem you could possibly think of. But is it, is it really worthwhile? And the caveat I always say is, specialty care is not always the answer. The more, and the illustration I have here is just, you know, the idea of too many cooks in the kitchen. So when you start fragmenting your care among other people, I mean, the job of your primary care provider is to be the quarterback, so to speak. So to keep tabs on who you're seeing, what they say, how things are changed. But when you have one person that's, you know, your hypertensive spe specialist in the cardiology department, and they make some change to your blood pressure medication, and then you see the kidney expert in the nephrology department, and he says, oh, your kidneys can't handle that medication, let's change the dose on that again. And then by the time you come to see me for your follow-up, I have no idea what dose you're supposed to be on, or, you know, it, it becomes very difficult as a provider to figure out what's going on, much less as a patient trying to understand all of this. And so the more that you can have managed by one provider, the better. And if you do need to see you know, other specialists, I think that's reasonable and that's fine. But just keep in mind that complications come with that. The one thing I would say, and this is not me promoting Stanford or saying you need to do, get all of your care at Stanford because I'm biased towards Stanford. I say that if you are going to see specialists, it should try to be within the same health system only because it's easier to keep track of everything. If, if I'm seeing you in the Stanford system and you had an MRI at Sequoia Hospital and then you had, uh, you had your gallbladder out at El Camino Hospital, that's much more difficult for us to track down all the details regarding that and what medications got changed when and what you should be on or not on than if 
you have all of it done here and I can simply go into your chart and see what each of those things were that happened, what the outcomes were, and make an informed decision about what should you still be on, what follow-up do you need, and where do we go from here. So that's the general overview of, of what, what you need to think about when you're at your, at your first visit, if you do take my advice and, and consider really establishing a healthcare baseline. Um, the end of my talk, that's my dog. She's about as healthy as they come. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions that you folks have. Yes? So when you uh, prepare like a list of questions and uh, concerns, mm -hmm. What if you're going to have a procedure that you're not really too clear about yourself, but you want kind of like the inside track? Like, um, I'm really contemplating actually having a surgical uh, fusion. Mm -hmm. You know, sir, uh, I have uh, spondylolisthesis of the spine, mm -hmm. sports injury. So um, I kind of want to know how to go about there, maybe like um, implementing a certain questions there that probably would pertain to that. But it's sure. not really my specialty. Obviously, I'm not a doctor or a surgeon. Yeah, no. Uh, I mean, obviously the basic there. What would be the time recovery? How much mm -hmm. would be off work? Those type of things what would be involved with the pain, but I'm sure there's other questions there that would probably be good, but I wouldn't know how to about really how to pass that along there to the professional. There. Sure, the so, so the question in general is, and I, I won't repeat it verbatim, um, but it's, it's essentially, how do you go about coming up with what questions you should be asking your providers? And the example given was for a, a surgical procedure, for instance, you know, um, a, a, a spinal fusion. You know, what sh questions should be asked when you speak to your surgeon or your primary care provider? And I think the first thing to consider is who you're asking the questions to. So if you have very specific questions about a very specific procedure, for instance, what is the average time to recovery for this procedure? That may be more reasonable for the surgeon. Whereas if, if it's, you know, have you had other patients that had this procedure and how did they do? That could probably be answered by either, either person. I, I think the easiest way to start is just think about, OK, what do I do in my daily life now? And how is that going to change? So I get up, I get dressed. Am I going to be able to do that by myself after I have the surgery? I you know, make my own breakfast. Is that going to be a problem? Am I going to be able to go grocery shopping? Am I going to be in a lot of pain when I'm done with this? Am I going to require medications that maybe will make it more difficult for me to do these things? I go to work. Am I going to be able to go to work? How long will I be off of work for? And how is this going to work out with my employer? Is there paperwork that will need to be completed to give to my employer? Then, then I you know, drive to the grocery store. Again, am I going to be able to drive? Will I need to have you know, a significant other drive me, or a family member, or will transportation be required? You can think even more broadly, and will I be safe in my own home? You know, if, I, if you live in, you know, a split level, enormous home, and you won't be able to walk, then that may not be reasonable. You may need to think about, um, is it, am I going to be able to go home after this procedure? Um, so just starting to think about, you know, the daily life. And then for specifics regarding the procedure itself, most surgeons discuss those things. Risks, benefits, you know, things commonly seen. That's part of your preoperative process. But um, you know, it's not just worth discussing with your um, surgeon. Often, you will, if you have other medical issues or it's a major surgery, they will want a primary care provider to give you a uh, preoperative clearance. So just a check over to make sure that you're in good health, you're medically optimized, as we like to say, so all tuned up and in the best shape you can be before your surgery. And, um, and there, so it's helpful if you have someone who knows you, who's been following you, and can say, you know, your blood pressure has been a little high for a while, but it's been pretty stable. I don't think there's a need to change your medications now, and I think you could continue to take these medications until the day before your surgery. Come see me when you're done, and we'll talk about your blood pressure medicine again. As opposed to, you walk into someone's office who's never seen you before, you're nervous, you're having pain from whatever's wrong that needs a surgery, and your blood pressure is through the roof, and then that person is left to wonder, does this guy have chronic high blood pressure, or is this just a situational thing? And so things like that can make a real difference in, in how you approach your surgery. Um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, with this specific, I mean, um, with this specific, specific procedure there, it seems very invasive, and mm -hmm. I should have had it done years ago. Mm -hmm. Obviously, age is not on my side, so it's even a little bit more significant because mm -hmm. I had this when I was actually a teenager. Mm -hmm. But it's always, to me, it's like a major excavation <laughs> that they're going, and yet I know I'd, I'd be having it done here at Stanford, which they have, obviously, mm -hmm. great surgeons here and there, mm -hmm. but I guess to kind of put my mind at ease there, and that's why I was kind of thinking uh, about maybe certain questions, and you gave me a pretty good baseline to start off there with there, but... I guess really more to kind of confirm me there and put my mind at ease there as far as... Sure. And, and I'm sure and these procedures go on all the time. And, just, and the other thing to think about is, you know, talk to the staff at your surgeon's office. You know, have they seen other, other patients that have had this procedure? What are some of the challenges that they've faced or dealt with? Or what do, what do people typically look like when they come back for their follow-up appointments? What can I expect? And then, of course, there's always your own risk-benefit evaluation. Is it worthwhile to... Um, to even have this invasive procedure. And, and that's, again, a discussion, a dialogue that should be had. Yes, sir. Uh, well, since the Affordable Care Act came out, a lot of people are worried about uh, seeing the same doctor. To me, this seems humorous. Whenever I see a, a doctor around here, you see the same student first for three years until he leaves. And you almost never see the same doctor. Mm -hmm. I had, had no idea who would be a primary doctor because each time you see the student for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then you see the, the, the doctor who happens to be there that day for two or three minutes. Isn't that the way things work here? Or, or am I not understanding what I should be doing? So this gentleman is voicing the common concerns of many people that are part of the clinics that are primarily staffed by trainees here. So medical students, medical residents, and fellows. And his, his concerns are that, you know, when you show up at many clinics, you never see the same doctor every time. And that you, you know, see someone for the first 15 minutes, a trainee or a medical student, and then whatever covering attending position is there um, comes in. And, and, and it can really give you the impression that your care is fragmented. And that is, that is kind of, part of the, the um, medical education um, aspect of, of many of Stanford's clinics. Um, well, it can be difficult. Well, I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> you do get to see different, different doctors and right. different ideas. And they say, and I think it's probably true, all, all the records are there right. and they turn on the computer right. and so they have more available than if you saw the same doctor who has 40 patients and mm -hmm. might not remember everything. Yep. So he just made the excellent point of the, the pro side of having a trainee clinic, which is you have, although it's different people, the, with, a, with the advancement of medical records, they're able to review everything that is, has been done by previous providers. Many times, because they're seeing the patient for the first time, they've done a more thorough review than of a physician who may be used to seeing you and hasn't been as, as, as uh, up to date on the records. And you get a fresh perspective on, on your medical care and what they think. And there is a continuity that is built into having this record that's available for whatever provider is there um, reviewing your, your chart. Um, so there are pluses and minuses to do it. I think the important thing is to know what do you prefer? Are you okay with, you know, helping to enrich the education of a, of a medical trainee at the expense of the continuity of seeing the same person? Or are you someone that really wants to see your, you know, your doctor, your NP every time and then, um, you know, have that kind of continuity? And, and I think that's something to consider. Both types of practices exist here and in other health systems around, around the area. And, just keeping that in mind um, as, you're, as you're pursuing who you'd like to establish your care with is, an, is certainly an important consideration. Does the Stanford patients have a regular doctor as opposed to those who have uh, the clinic? So he asked what percentage of um, Stanford patients have a regular, uh, a regular doctor, so to speak, as opposed to uh, a trainee clinic. I'll be honest, I don't know that. That is not a number I'm familiar with. I will say even in my office where I am the primary provider and see most of my patients most of the time, I do have fellows with me once a week. I do have medical students that come through. And so even though I would say I'm probably not in that trainee clinic setting, there's still a chance that if you came to see me, you would see a trainee first. 
Um, I, th I think the take home point there though is that, again, the, if you keep your care within one location where all the records are there, it certainly does help to form some form of continuity, whether it's the same person or just the, the same chart there that can be reviewed. Does that make sense? Yeah, question? And how do you know if you're signing up for um, having seen the same doctor each time or whether you'll be in the situation where you're seeing different doctors? Is it different divisions at Stanford that dictate that? So the question is how do you find that out? If, if you will be seeing the same doctor every time or whether you'll be involved with trainees. I think it's a safe assumption to think that at some point if you are seeing a, a provider here at Stanford, you may be seeing a trainee, um, at least initially. Um, as, I, as I said, you know, I have trainees come through all the time, and so although my, my patients generally see me on a regular basis, there's always a chance that a medical student may see them first. The best way to find out is when you call to establish care, ask the care coordinator that you're speaking with. You know, is this a primarily non-teaching practice is usually the best way to call it, a non-teaching practice. Um, or will this be a, a teaching practice or a, a resident? clinic or things like that, but kind of asking, is this a teaching practice is a good way to, to establish, before you even establish care, what am I in for when I show up? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I called up one time and asked if they can transfer records between those three places you mentioned. And the medical records department said they didn't know when I called them. Do you know if, if, they, if the medical records kept at uh, Palo Alto Medical Clinic, UCSF, and Stanford have the same program, more or less? So the question is, if you have records at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, UCSF, and Stanford, are they really all available? Um, and the answer is technically yes. As I said, we have through EPIC, which is our, EPIC is the name of our electronic medical record that we use. And those other entities also have EPIC. And there is a, a, a it's, it's fairly recent. I will say we're probably in the beta testing if, if, version, although they may say otherwise, of, of this Care Everywhere program, where theoretically, I should be able to pull up your records from all of those places by logging into your chart in, in Stanford's EPIC system. Again, as you implement technology, there's always you know, a, a difficulty. Not everything will be there. Certain things may not be present, especially if they're older. You know, the Care Everywhere only covers a certain chunk of, of your chart. So if you've been seeing someone at UCSF for 20 years, we may only have your last five years worth of information from that provider. So it's not perfect. There is still going to be forms to sign, faxes to send, you know, stacks of paper to sort through. It is not a perfect system by any means. Um, but it's a work in progress, and I would say it's come a lot farther in the last you know, five years than it has, has previously. And I think it's, it's going to continue to get better and, and hope, help to streamline care in general. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you.